Well, John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus uh, speaking to his disciples, he declares that I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So I want to take the next few moments and talk about the glory of the father as the vine dresser or as the gardener. Roman number one, the need for the revelation of the father. We are in, in great need for a Holy Spirit unveiling to our hearts about the glory and the beauty and the majesty of who the Father is. Uh, there is so much that the Scripture has to say to us about the Father and who He is, and there is a significant dimension of strength that uh, comes to the church as the church continues to yield our hearts to Jesus' ministry she said in John 17, 26, she said, I Father, I declare your name and I will declare it. That's one of the primary things that Jesus does is revealing the heart of the Father uh, to us as his people. Now, one of the premises of the forerunner ministry is focused on the Holy Spirit's emphasis to bring the end time revelation of the Father. There is great need, there is great understanding that the Holy Spirit has for us related to who the Father is, what he's like, what it is that he is, is about. And as the days and the weeks and the months and the years unfold, uh, there's gonna be an increase of the proclamation of the glory of the Father as well as an increase of the demonstration of the Father in and through his people. Paragraph B, one of Jesus' primary aims in John 13 to 17, one of his primary aims is to connect his disciples, yea, us as believers, to grow in the knowledge of the Father. That's one of the, the main aims is to give us insight into who the Father is and that we may know him and interact with him so that we can confidently engage with him as well as receive from the Father's heart, his personhood, as well as his leadership. He's equipping our hearts to know how to relate with Jesus, excuse me, how to relate with the Father intimately and how to confidently trust his leadership by understanding the way that he interacts with us, specifically in John 15, as it pertains to his pruning. A growing in understanding of the glory of the Father is essential to our faith. It is absolutely essential to our faith. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in just a few moments, but... The, 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 the understanding of the Father has almost kind of like been relegated to like this elementary understanding of our faith. Okay, we got that done with, and let's move on. And no, beloved, the subject of the heart of the Father is critical to our faith. In fact, it is essential. It is Jesus' primary uh, uh, strategy, according to John 17, 26, to equip the church to walk in the first commandment. In John 17, 26, this is what he says, and I have declared to them your name, talk to the Father, and he says, and I will declare it. And so this is something that I did in the past uh, throughout my ministry. This is something that I'm doing in the present, and this is something that I will continue to do in the future. And I believe even into the age to come, in my opinion, that he is always going to be declaring and unfolding to us who the Father is. And look what he says, that or so that, or because in doing this, the love with which you have loved me may be in them. And so there really is no way in growing in the first commandment outside our hearts yielded to the Lord's ministry by the Spirit to open up our understanding through the word of who the Father is and getting to know him. Unfortunately, 
the, the father in, in, in many ways by people is almost kind of like understood as this Old Testament God. And, and even that understanding is, is, uh, is, is erroneous because the revelation of, of God in the Old Testament, the revelation of God in the New Testament, is, is, it's the same God. He, he, he didn't have a mood change because of the cross. It's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But because in the minds of many people, the Old Testament God is kind of like this angry God, and the Old Testament God in the New Testament is this loving God, many have relegated the Old Testament God to the Father. And they, f- and they forget that John 3.16, for God, the Father so loved the world that he gave his Son. And so growing in the revelation of the Father is absolutely essential to, to the first commandment. In fact, in John 14, uh, that was one of the things that the disciples were asking Jesus for. They said, Father, uh, would you show us the Father, Jesus, and this will be sufficient for us. And Jesus says, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And uh, I'm trying to think here. I think it's in, uh, see here, it's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, where the writer of Hebrews quotes Isaiah, where, uh, excuse me, quoting in a, a Psalm 22, saying that Jesus will be in the midst of the assembly declaring the name of the Father. I really believe that a billion years from now, Jesus is going to continue to give us insight by the Holy Spirit about the glory and the splendor and the fellowship of the Father. In fact, uh, I believe the book of Revelation is about the Father. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says that if you see me, you, you see the Father. Paragraph C, the revelation of the Father was the primary focus of Satan's assault against Jesus in the wilderness. He was questioning uh, Jesus' identity as a son, but in doing so, he was attacking the, the, the character and the nature of the Father. That is how essential this understanding is to the human heart, the revelation of the Father. And I really believe that as the days will continue to unfold, that is going to be one of the things that the Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to put a tremendous emphasis on us understanding the nature and the character of who the Father is. The revelation of the Father, I believe, is supreme. It was part of the hidden mystery, the Apostle Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 3 and Colossians chapter 1 and other passages, he talks about this hidden mystery, he talks about this plan that was hidden in the heart of God that the Old Testament prophets could not access, that it was for an appointed time for the Son of God to become a man and to declare it with his own lips, and then after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, give it to the apostles who put it within the Word of God. And I believe that part of that mystery is the, was the full unlocking, the full unveiling of the revelation of God as our Father. God was known in the Old Testament as king, judge, bridegroom, master, warrior, provider, healer, in the Law and the Prophets, we see, in the Psalms, we see the attributes of the Father, and we see some mentions of the Father in, in the Old Testament. But most of the mentions of the Father in the Old Testament are related to him being the creator of all or, or, or the one who sovereignly brought Israel out of Egypt, giving birth to a nation, or related to their covenant promises. But there's a distinct difference between the unveiling of the Father in the Old Testament and the unveiling of the Father in the New Covenant. It's, it's a, uh, it's a, it, it, is a, it is an entirely different reality of, uh, of how God revealed himself as Father to us in the New Covenant. But again, we see these fatherly attributes um, of God in the, in, the, in the law, the Psalms, and the Prophets. However, the revelation of God the Father in the way that the New Testament talks about was not known until Jesus came on the scene and he declared it to the nation of Israel. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in a times past to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. The way I like to think of it is that the, the revelation of God 
to the prophet were mere whispers. But the revelation of God through the Son was thunderous. It was final. It was complete. Everything of what God has to say about himself, he says, in and through his Son. Luke chapter 10, verses 21 to 22 Jesus, he says, I thank you, Father, for you've hidden these things, referring to the mystery. You've hidden these things. So you, now you've, you've revealed them to babes. And one of the things that was hidden that he has now has revealed is what he says later on. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and to whom the one the Son wills to reveal him. This understanding of who the Father is, it is absolutely essential. It is Part of the distinction of the new covenant, it is to know the Father, number one. It is to experience the Father and to partner with the Father, having deep, intimate relationship with God as our Father. Paragraph D. Now, when we're talking about the revelation of the Father, one of the things that has happened is not only has he been kind of been relegated to kind of like Christianity 101, He's also been kind of pushed into the inner healing, in a, you know, a, a, a corner. Okay. <clears throat> right? And so, so the, 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 is the, you know, the people that are hurting, so to speak, they need the heart of the Father. The rest of us can go on to bigger and better stuff. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is that the revelation of the Father is complete. It is holy and it is supreme. It was so much on the forefront of Jesus' mind that he says, I've declared it, and I will continue to declare it. Understanding God the Father is not merely therapeutic. Yes, there are therapeutic components for sure in terms of how it affects our emotions and the healing that it can bring to us. Uh, but it is not just therapeutic. It is all-encompassing. It is transcendent. There is, it is holy in nature. We're talking about the uncreated God. The heart of the Father is greater than filling here it is, the, 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 the heart of the Father is greater than filling the vacuums created by the failures of our natural fathers. I want to say this again. The revelation of the Father is greater than him simply filling or making up to fill the vacuum that was created by our natural fathers. The, the, the amount of brokenness and pain that exists in the earth because of the brokenness of our fathers is, is vast. But unfortunately, the revelation of the father has been reduced to simply making up for where they lacked. And as a result, the, the limiting of the therapeutic perspective of the father, what it, what it can do, it can leave now watch this, it can leave those who've had you know, great fathers in the natural, it can leave them with great difficulty of recognizing that they need the revelation of the father as well. But there's many who conclude because they've had, you know, as good of a father as you can get in the natural, uh, on this side, of, uh, this side of life, they have concluded in some way that they, that they are not in as much need of the revelation of the Father, and that is because the revelation of the Father has been reduced to a therapeutic understanding. We all are in need of the revelation of the Father. It's what Jesus came to bring through the gospel. It's what Jesus came to demonstrate to the point that he says, look, if you've seen me, you've seen him. Constantly pointing to the Father. We must resist sentimentalizing our understanding of the Father. Again, yes, there are very powerful, uh, for lack of better terms, therapeutic components to understanding the Father. In terms of healing and the tenderness of the Father and the love of the Father. But there's more to him than, like I said earlier, than filling up that which was lacking because of the mistakes of our earthly fathers. From the greatest of dads to the best of dads, Jesus has to say this in Luke 11, verse 13. He goes, if you being evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children. Paragraph E, the understanding of the father was ultimate in the mind of the apostles. It was foremost in the mind of Jesus, both in his relationship with God as well as it pertains to his mission, his messianic mission. The thing that was on the, on the forefront of Jesus' mind as he, in his relationship with God, was relating with him as the Father, first and foremost. And as it comes to his mission, it was the declaring, it was the displaying, it was the revealing of the Father. So much so that in John 17, verse 1, Jesus prayed, Father, the hour has come. Now glorify your son, that your, glory, that your son may also glorify you. It is the hour of the cross has come. It is here. Now put your son on display, because in putting your son on display, Father, you are the one that will be displayed as well. In fact, you know, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 a very, um, uh, you know, kind of like probably the most prayed prayer here at IHOP. Uh, I, I get a chuckle sometimes, and I do the same thing, so this is, not, this is not some big negative. But most of the time when that prayer gets prayed, what we're asking for is for the revelation of Jesus. But the context of the passage is actually asking for the revelation of the Father. That's what Paul is asking for that the church of Ephesus would grow in the revelation of the Father and know his plan and know his purpose and know his inheritance and so forth. Now, of course, you know, reveal Jesus, we see the Father, so there's no need to spit hairs over it. I'm just simply making a point of emphasis. There is a far greater emphasis in the minds of the apostles than we realize when it comes to the unveiling of the heart of the Father and who he is. That again, that is beyond, for lack of better terms, our therapeutic need and understanding of who he is. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, the apostle Paul says this. He says, look, he says, Jesus is, gonna, is going to come back. He's going to reign on the earth until everything is subject to him. He says, and then after everything is subject to him, then Jesus will subject himself, the Son will subject himself to the Father, that God would be all in all. Turn to page two. The Father asks, the gardener, the father as the gardener. In John 15, 1, Jesus declares both his identity as divine as well as his position under the father's leadership. As divine, he is under the leadership of the vine dresser, the gardener. The father, as a vine dresser, is determined, has a determined plan that his son, the vine, would be the divine life source for the redeemed. That under the father's leadership, he determined that the only way that we could be recipients and experience his presence, his life-giving power, his grace, his mercy, and his love is by being connected to the vine. Paragraph B, the father as the vine dresser is the only, from what I can tell, it's the only description of the father in John 13 to 17. The father is mentioned all throughout John 13 to 17, but it's the only description of the father is that it's the vine dresser. And I think that part of what is happening here is that the whole process of John 13 to 17, and several sessions ago we talked about this, how John chapter 13 gives us the requirement. The requirement ultimately is this, that we would love one another as he has loved us. That's the requirement. And John chapter 17 is the destiny. The destiny, how, do, how uh, it, it is the church arriving to that destiny of John 13, 34, and 35. 
And I think that when Jesus reveals the Father as the vine dresser, I think he's showing us that the whole John 13 to 17 process, the Father's leadership, he will manifest himself to us as a gardener. And so we are invited to, to look into this description of him and to receive increased insight into the knowledge of God. I think of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, where Paul talks about the athlete, he talks about the soldier, he talks about the hardworking farmer, and then in verse 7 he says, he says, consider these things or ponder these things, meditate on these things, and may the Lord give you much insight. And I think that is part of what is happening here when he says I, that the Father is the vine dresser. I think that we are invited to, to meditate on that truth, to engage with the Father related to that truth. You know, the, the thing that we've, we've been talking about is the Father, thank you that you are the vine dresser. Thank you that you are the gardener. Would you show me more? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, may the Lord give us much understanding in these things. So here's a couple thoughts about gardeners. I'm going to, by the time you guys are going to go, man, Stuart just got a green thumb. No, not really. <laughs> Gardeners are those who work in close proximity with the seed, the soil, and the vegetation. And so this idea of the gardener or the vine dresser it actually evokes this image of one who works with his hands, even touching the dirt itself. Very close, intimate proximity. I think it's actually part of the revelation of the Father of the Vine Dress that speaks of his humility. He gets down and dirty, he gets up close and personal and interacts with us and prunes us and cultivates us and unto forming us to become fully his disciples and to be filled with joy and to be filled with love and to come into the fullness of the destiny of John chapter 17. Now, what are some of the characteristics of a gardener? I got a little, uh, a little link over there, and you can look at that in your own time. But some of the characteristics of a, of a gardener is that they're patient. It's one of the reasons why I'm not a gardener. <laughs> No, it takes a tremendous amount of patience. I remember, you know, in, in uh, you know, some of you guys may remember this as well, in grade school, they always had, to, always had us grow these plants, you know, and for a biology class, and my plants never made it. Because I, I just got impatient. And, uh, but I actually remember the first time I actually decided to actually be patient with the process. And... The joy that I felt when, when one of my plants actually sprouted. I thought, man, this is really amazing. So patience. Determination. Actually sticking with it. And so the father is patient as a vine dresser. He is focused and determined. Another characteristic of a gardener is that there's hope. They, they are, they, they've got confidence that this thing is going to work out. The Father has tremendous hope in the process, in the way that he relates with us, as he cultivates us, as he raises us up, as he develops us, as he forms us and shapes us. The gardeners have a, a kindness about them just because of their interaction with nature. It just, just creates this different dynamic. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, article if you, can, if you get a chance to read it. They're skillful. Gardeners have skill in understanding of the soil, understanding of the seeds, understanding of the plant itself. Paragraph D, a good gardener has thorough knowledge of the vegetation and the soil they work with to cultivate. And so when Jesus says that the Father is the vine dresser, He's saying that the Father is deeply acquainted with our emotional frame. He's deeply acquainted with our ways. And he's deeply acquainted with our physical bodies. He knows us full well. The Father does. 
We look at Psalm 139, verse 3. I got it right there in the notes. You comprehend my path and my laying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. He's acquainted with my ways. He's acquainted with our mannerisms. He is acquainted with the intricacies of our personalities. He is very well acquainted with the way that we are wired. He understands our thought processes very, very intimately. He understands our, our patterns, the way that we think and act and feel and why we think and act and feel the way that we do. He's very, very intimately acquainted. And all that factors in in the way that he interacts with us and, uh, and leads us and prunes us and trains us. In Psalm 103, verse 14, it says, He knows our frame and he remembers that we are but dust. I believe that it's speaking of, our, again, our inner workings, our emotional frame, our emotional makeup. He understands it. He knows exactly how much pressure to apply and and how much pressure not to apply. He is deeply and intimately acquainted with our frame. Luke 12, verse 7. But the very hairs of your head are also numbered. I mean, that's how deeply acquainted is. He knows our bodies, everything about it. And it's taken great concern to uh, to count the, the numbers of the hairs on our head, which, you know, the old joke is, which is easier for some than for others. By the way, the number is, and um, they say that for the average person, it's about 100,000 hairs on their head. Right? The Lord is intimately acquainted with them. Paragraph E. What's the divine gardener's goal? Well, his goal is through the process of pruning to produce the love of God in and through his, uh, in and through his people to those that are around us. What's the goal of the gardener? It is to produce the love of God in and through the people of God to those that are around us. The gardener, he seeks to cultivate, to mature followers who are fully committed to his leadership. This is what brings him glory. Again, it's about the magnifying of the Father and who he is. In John 15, verse 8, by this the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be his disciples. So he's the vine dresser. He prunes, he takes away the, the, the branches that don't bear fruit, and it's about bringing him glory, the magnifying of who the Father is. Paragraph F, the Father, through the gardening process, leads us into the fullness of joy. And that's one of the... Uh, the promises that Jesus makes, he says, look, the Father is cultivating us. He is interacting with us in an intimate way. He, he prunes us, which more times than none, this pruning happens through the process of our circumstances. And through our circumstances, he's, again, he knows exactly how to orchestrate our circumstances in such an intimate way for the purpose of positioning us to receive more of the love of God and for that love to be expressed in us and through us to those that are around us. A part of, part of progression of John 15 is that Jesus says that, that, that we're to abide in him, number one, that we're to bear much fruit. And so he talks about this fruit for, about, for a couple of verses. But after a while, he says... I want you to abide in me that you may keep my commandments. And so we find out that the fruit that we're called to bear is the keeping of his commandments. And then he can, goes on for a few more verses in verse 12, and he says, then this is my commandment, that you love one another. And that's the thing that the father, the gardener is doing. He's seeking to cultivate us, to train us through the process of pruning, 
by causing us to experience more of the love of God, his love to be formed in us and for his love to be expressed through us to those that are around us, both in the church and those who are outside the church. And the ultimate product, so to speak, is that we would have the fullness of joy that ultimately comes from responding to his leadership through the loving obedience of his commandments. Let's go to page three. So Jesus in John chapter 15, verse one, he starts out by saying, I'm divine and my father is the vine dresser. I just wanna take a few moments and talk about this issue of Jesus being divine. And again, we've had several sessions in terms of him being divine as it relates to our personal lives. But the thing that we have to remember is that Jesus as a Messiah, he didn't just come to individuals. He came to Israel. He came to bring salvation to Israel to see her restored and to bring her into the fullness of God's promises. Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah 27. When Jesus declares himself as the true vine, there are layers of truths implied in that statement, I believe. Because it is likely when he says that he is the true vine, that he is contrasting himself with Israel, who is the the rebellious vineyard, the vineyard that is not bearing good grapes, like it says in Isaiah chapter 5, but rather it bears these wild fruits because it's not yielding to the leadership of the gardener. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine, I believe that uh, it is a truth that he's stating that is filled with hope, and it is a promise of grace that would come into, uh, excuse me, it's a promise of grace that would come from the Father to bring us into the fullness of the promises that he has for the Jewish people. It is the Father's desire to fill the earth with the expression of his power, his personality, his purpose, and that's one of the things he spoke to, uh, to Abraham about. He told Abraham that that he would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. The the very election, the very calling of Abraham was for the purpose of bringing a blessing or bringing his blessing to the nations of the earth. Paragraph B, vineyards, they are a very common place in the ancient world. A very common place in the ancient world. The Lord mentions uh, mentions of Israel being a vineyard, speaks of his aim to see her provided for, prospered, and as well as being a society that is filled with joy. To get a little bit more of a feel for what is going on with this vineyard um, uh, 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 analogy or example, uh, look at Isaiah chapter 6, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 5, in Ezekiel chapter 15, both of those passages you see, and there's many more, but those are, those are like the two main ones where Israel is shown forth as a vineyard, and it's a vineyard that is not producing the fruit that God desires. And she is unable to produce the fruit that God desires because of the law. And so Jesus comes in the saying, he says, you know what? He says, I am the true vine. I am the true Israel through whom Israel will be brought into the fullness of her inheritance of the promises that God gave her through the prophets. And what we see here is that the aim, however, of Israel becoming this vineyard, it goes beyond Israel and it actually extends into the nations of the earth as well. Isaiah 27, verse 2, the Lord uh, tells a prophet, he says, sing about the fruitful vineyard, and speaking about Israel's future. And the Lord says this, he says, I watch over it. I believe that here he is speaking as the gardener. He says, I watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it. And so here again, we see this, this very intentional, intimate engagement, focus, attention to the vineyard. He says, I watch over it. 
I water it continually. I guard it. By the way, we can personalize this. Because again, because John 15 is also speaking, is speaking directly to us as, as, as individuals. He says, you know what? As a gardener, as a vine dresser, he says, I watch over you. Because I water you continually. And I guard you day and night that no one may harm it. But in verse 6, it says, in that day, in the days to come, Jacob will take root. In other words, Jacob will become the garden that God had designed for Jacob to be. Israel will bud and Israel will blossom. But here's the sentence. And it will fill the whole world with fruit. It is as though where this whole thing is going is that God wants this garden. God wants this vineyard, and he will establish it in Israel. But the idea is is for that garden to be cultivated and to grow until it fills the whole earth. For the whole world to become that vineyard. And so John 15, verse 1, is is a very... um, it's. It's a, tr- it's a tremendously powerful messianic hope that's being stated right there. He said, because Israel has failed as a vineyard. She's unable to produce the fruit that I have commanded her to produce. But the same is true for the nations. And Jesus comes on the scene. He says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. He goes, if you abide in me, Israel, you will bear much fruit. If you abide in me, O oh individual, he goes, you will bear much fruit. If you abide in me, O oh Israel, you will bear much fruit. If you abide in me, O oh nations of the earth, you will bear much fruit. And you'll be filled with tremendous joy, John 15, 11. Paragraph C. John 15, if properly understood, is properly understood, again, through the lens of individual discipleship. And so there is the the, the individual discipleship, the individual focus on John 15 is very, very, very appropriate. That is the most clear, direct, and obvious reading. But I think there's more going on because the Jewish Messiah talking to this new leadership in Israel, these apostles, and they are filled with a messianic expectation about what God would do for the nation of Israel. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is in that stating, I am the hope of Israel. I am the one who will bring the vineyard that is prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 5. I will bring it into fullness. I will bring it to the fullness of fruit, and I will bring it into the fullness of joy. Again, this individual interpretation of John 15, I believe, is the primary application, and it's the appropriate uh, application of of John 15. However, I think this passage has likely has eschatological implications as well, as Jesus declares himself to be the true vine in contrast to the vineyard or the unfaithful vineyard called Israel. Paragraph D, set the worship team come up. Paragraph D. Isaiah chapter 1 to chapter 5, what is happening there is the prophet, he gives a summary that gives an overview of the major covenantal themes, God's commitment to Israel and, his, and, and, uh, and the fact that God would even discipline Israel to bring her into the fullness of her end time purpose. Isaiah chapter 5 as well as Ezekiel chapter 15 Israel is portrayed as a vineyard that is under divine judgment, completely and entirely unable to respond to the God of Israel in order to bring her into her covenantal promises. What we see in Isaiah chapter 5 and what we see in Ezekiel chapter 15 is Israel's dilemma. She cannot obey the Lord, which is, again, the dilemma of all of the human race. We cannot follow the Lord unless we abide in divine, unless we agree with the Father's leadership, divine dresser, that the only way we can bear fruit is if we abide in divine, Christ Jesus, through whom the life-giving power of God touches our lives, that we can bear the fruit that he requires from us. 
Jesus is the true Israel through whom the Jewish people will inherit the full covenantal promises. Israel will abide in Jesus. Israel will abide in the true vine. Amen? All right, well, let's stand.